afternoon for this roundtable on regional research, research that has to do with New Mexico, with New Mexican history, uh, with New Mexican cultural studies. I'm Professor Ana Novar. I'm in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese um, in the area of Southwest Studies. We have here also Professor Emeritus Enrique Lamadri, also of Hispanic Southwest Studies in the Department of Spanish Portuguese. He was my professor when I was an undergraduate when he was up here. Um, and you know, based on that formation, here here we are now, you know, and sort of carrying carrying on this legacy from Enrique. We have three wonderful presentations today. All of these students are students who graduated from UNM with undergraduate degrees and then continued into the master's program in Southwest Studies in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. And um, there are different years of study. Angelica Padilla is finishing her second year of her master's program, so she'll be graduating Woo! in May. <laughs> Juliana Wiggins, um, this is her second semester here at UNM, or here, here sorry, not at UNM, <laughs> here in the Master's of Southwest Studies program. And Deborah Nieto, same thing, Woo! second semester in Hispanic Southwest Studies here at the University of Mexico Department of Spanish and Portuguese Southwest Studies program but not at UNM. Um, <laughs> these are longtime UNM people, just like you all, right? Um, so we are going to be, each of these panelists is talking about a different type of research related to Southwest Studies with which they're currently engaged. All three projects um, have received the generous funding of the Center for Regional Studies, um, which has uh, provided support for these, for these ongoing projects. Um, I don't work actively with Angelica, but I do with Juliana and with Deborah. So let's start with Angelica, who's going to discuss her research at the Center for Southwest Research, which as you may know, I'm sure you can explain to them where it can be found. <laughs> Angelica. Hi, right. hi guys. Um, my name is Angelica Padilla. As Ana said, it's uh, my second year with the graduate program, and I'll be graduating in May, if all goes according to plan. Um, so I got my undergraduate degree in, I double majored in chemistry and in Spanish. And then back in like 2014, and I was all about like the scientific route. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a pharmacist. I'm gonna go, you know, discover cures for everything. And then I did not like it at all. So I took a year off and was like trying to find myself. I ended up teaching abroad. I, I taught English abroad in Chile, in um, one of the southern. If you look on the map, it's like the last solid piece of land in Chile before it turns into little islands and then goes into like Antarctica. So I froze, but I absolutely loved it. And then while I was in Chile, I was like, I have to go back and get my master's in Spanish. Like, Spanish is my thing. I, I was like homesick, and I'm like, I just miss Southwest studies. After taking Anna's class, I'm like, I just have to go back. So I applied to the program, and sure enough, I was like, yes. Is where, and I, I still to this day feel like this is exactly where I like, meant to be. Um, and then I came across um, the opportunity to do a fellowship within the Center, of, um, Center for Southwest Research. And for those of you who don't know where it's at, it's in Zimmerman Library. Um, all you do is like, you walk in and then you take a left, like an immediate left, and you're, you're there. So um, it's a lot of cool, be it's really cool because they have a lot of archives and I mean stuff pertaining to the region that no one really gets to see and you can spend hours if you're like so cool, like, if you're like all about that, it, it's easy to spend hours um, looking at archives and newspapers and stuff. So I'm going to kind of show you what I do there. Um, I am working with the Arelio Espinosa collection. Arelio Espinosa. Um, it was around the era of like 18, 1880 to like 1950, and um, he was a professor at Stanford University. But believe, he was born in Southern Colorado. He came to UNM, and he was one of the first Chicanos to get a PhD here at UNM. But they decided, okay, he knows Spanish. We're gonna, and he got his PhD in anthropology. So, but they were like, no, he knows Spanish. Let's throw him to the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and he can teach a foreign language. He could teach Spanish. So it, he kind of felt, you know, hey, that's not right. I have a PhD in anthropology. I want to be doing all this anthropology, anthropology research, and instead he was teaching like, you know, the subjunctive or whatever, right? <laughs> So he applied to Stanford, and Stanford took him right away. So he was actually able to do his um, everything he wanted to do involving research and um, ethnographic studies at Stanford. Um, and it's really cool because a lot of his work has to do with New Mexico. And as I'm going through this collection, I'm realizing that 
it's like, and I'll show you some pictures, but it's like um, all northern New Mexico focused, and then at the bottom it's like Aurelio Espinosa, Stanford University. Like, oh, good for Stanford, good for Stanford, right? So um, here's kind of what I do. Um, I'm given, let me put this on the presentation. I'm just, the, we received the collection. It was donated by, I believe, his daughter. She just had all these boxes of his notes, of his publications. I mean, you know, like if you were to write a book, you're going to have like millions of copies of your own book, right, somehow. Mm -hmm. So there's just his publications, his notes, newspapers, things he's collected. It's like his library. So um, it's his own personal library. I went through it, and it's actually annotated by the um, by some of the authors. And it's like mi compañero, like another one who loves folklore, and it's just really cool because it's annotated. So this is what I started. This is some of like what I started with, plus a lot more boxes. And inside these boxes is stuff like this. So these are correspondence, these are letters. And these envelopes are full of letters. And they're not organized, and yeah. Here's some of his journals. <laughs> and look, like, you, I don't know what this paper is. Like, I don't know, but you got this. Then I found, okay, and then this is like what I do. So I go through all of this, and I put order to it. I label them, I put them in certain boxes, and then certain folders. And this is only as far as I've got so far, but don't worry, it's going to get a lot more organized, and then this is kind of like a bird eyes view of like all the folders and stuff. A key. So then in these boxes, this is stuff I've come across. Oh. Some photos, um, you could even see here, I don't know, it's Nuestra Señora de I don't know. Los Lagos, I think. He lived in California, obviously, because he taught at Stanford, but then he also lived in Spain for a while. So this could easily be, I don't know, and then there's some pictures. Oh. Like um, this is super, super, super cool for me, and like a total PhD project in my future. Um, these are his notebooks. If you can see, it says Penitente Manuscript. The Rio Arriba, New Mexico, y Abiquio. Oh, wow. yeah. Aquí, you have New Mexico passion narratives in verse. Hmm. And these are just like loose leaf papers in like, I mean, it's a composition notebook, guys. And then look, this is, I took a picture of like some of the insides. So is that his handwriting? That is so his handwriting. Yeah. And then this he, he typed up, but it's in a loose leaf. And I was kind of going through it earlier this morning. There's page one, it goes like page one, two, thirty-six. But they're all in there, I just have to find it and put it in order. But I mean, it would even be cool to like transcribe and make it electronically available. And then here's a cool little like newspaper clip thing. Um, it's annotated, it says, Abuelo de um, Aurelio M. Espinosa Sr. So this was his um, great, or this was his grandfather. And it talks about how he was a soldier in the um, Civil War. And he was even a Mexican soldier in the Civil War fighting for America. And it even mentions that that was like a rare honor for, um, and he was a captain. So it was like a rare honor for him to be a captain, a Mexican captain fighting for like the Civil War. And then that's Aurelio Espinosa himself. This is an article he wrote, The Propaganda Against Spain, King and Church Refuted. Um, this was back, I think, like 1930. It was in the monitor. And this is what I do. So then I put them all in a little spreadsheet, so that way it can eventually be found through like a database. And um, I give like box, like folder three, folder four, um, and then I'll eventually, once I have all my boxes, I'll be able to better organize and say what box it's in. Um, I don't know if I can like zoom in. But you can see like New Mexico Spanish folklore. Um, I took a picture of his actual, um, some of his actual publications. So here we have Spanish tradition among the Pueblo Indians, Spanish folklore in New Mexico, and then look, right, you see Espinosa, Stanford University. It's all about New Mexico, but it's in Stanford. Y aquí, speech, speech mixture in New Mexico, and then syllabotic, syllab Syllabic consonants in New Mexico Spanish. So he did a lot of folklore stuff and linguistics. He's like a really good pioneer when it comes to um, the linguistics here in our region. So.
so and the folklore too and then obviously like you, you saw the verses and stuff he did so that's what I do <laughs> okay and then our next presenter is Juliana Wiggins who's working on a different project um, that's an ethnographic project so what we've seen with Angelica is a project in which the Center for Southwest Research acquires a collection. So they acquire the papers of, in this case, of Professor Aurelio Espinosa. They also have, for example, the papers of Enrique La Madrid. And they get these boxes and boxes, as Angelica showed us, of raw material, put order to it, which is what Angelica is doing right now, and then create a finding aid for it so that um, future researchers can go and say, oh, yeah, I really, what about that like version of the pastores or um, this Rosario that I had heard about, or I read about, that Aurelio Espinosa documented, where can I find it? If you go online to the finding aid on the Rocky Mountain Online Archive, and it says box six, folder three. Here's where you can find Aurelio Espinosa's handwritten, uh, hand-organized um, version of, these, of this folkloric event, right, this particular event. So it's a process not only of creating order, but also of learning about the individual who created this archive. There's all sorts of levels of information there, right? Sometimes we take information in like it's a hopper sort of being poured in our direction. That's the opposite of how an archive works, where the contextual information tells us a lot about what's in there, what's next to what. what gets, how, and what, and what, sh what shape does the person who gives the organization to this collection provide that will affect how we look at it? It's kind of like the way Facebook controls your feed, right? <laughs> it's the same way. Exactly. The same sort of hierarchy of, of information and organization and how it arrives to you. All right, now we've got Juliana Wiggins. Juliana is working on a completely different project. It's an ethnographic project. Juliana. Yeah, so Angelica y mi otra compañera, Debra, they do their own sort of digging into archives. I like to dig into people and their stories, their histories, their narratives. Um, but just a little background of myself, I graduated from UNM with a degree in communication and journalism and a dual degree in Spanish, and I also minored in all in honors. So I went through the honors college and I also started my classes here in Spanish at UNM, fell in love, and decided that this was the program for me too. Um, but just a little overview about the project that I'm working with, um, with the generous, gen generous funding from the Center for Regional Studies and from the Office of the Vice President of Research. Um, we're in the, I'm working on a research team in the beginning stages of, um, it's titled Voces of Nuevo Mexico, so Voices of New Mexico. So our goal is to interview the baby boomer generation in the Rio Arriba and Rio Bajo um, regions of New Mexico. So all the way in northern New Mexico, um, up in Taos, and then all the way down at, um, in Anthony, New Mexico, which is about 30 minutes from Las Cruces. Um, and our goal is to interview the baby boomer generation because we feel that they have stories and narratives that may seem undervalued or less, so to say, traditional than, um, than we, what we might normally hear. Um, the reason why we chose the baby boomer population is because they they met a sort of intersect between tradition and that building urban landscape that New Mexico um, that New Mexico is starting to develop in the 1940s, 50s, and so on. Um, so we just feel that that's interesting because what they have to share about their language, so their language use, language retention, and what spaces they use their language. Um, can contribute to their identity. So how they feel like they contribute to their community, what they consume, and how they might perceive themselves, or how they feel they are perceived in their own community as well. Um, so with these interviews, we hope to sort of develop these underlying narratives, right? Because someone will tell you something, but it's kind of our job as ethnographic researchers to really find out what um, to really put that thought into words, right? Um, so, so yeah, what we want to look at is maybe what sort of hegemonic forces have infiltrated their communities while they were growing up. Um, and a really great quote from, from Santa Fe Nativa, which was a textbook that I read in my undergrad, um, from the work of Alfredo Celedón Luján, in his 
in his work, Nuestro Cornucopia, he says, Dime con quien andas shopping y te diré quien eres. So <laughs> what that means is, tell me where you do your shopping. Tell me how you shop. And I'll tell you who you are. And in, his, in this story in particular, it shows that sort of dichotomy or that cross-section between, you know, if you shop at Whole Foods versus where the old Piggly Wiggly was, <laughs> riding in the back of a 1956 Ford pickup versus driving in your Prius. That's why this generation, we feel like, has two different stories to tell combined into one person or one community. Um, so this next, the next part of this project, so this project is twofold. Um, as part of the research team, what we hope is to develop a class, a course curriculum to be taught um, simultaneously in the Honors College and in the Spanish department. So what we hope is to utilize our stories, our methodology in terms of interviewing, and project that and teach that and train undergraduate students to do the same. Um, I feel like there's a little bit of a researcher, there's a little bit of a curious person, everyone, especially as an undergrad when you're really developing those sorts of skills of communication and writing development as well. Um, so that would be our goal is to, is to create one class to be taught in the honors and Spanish department um, and really to train individuals in this type of research because it's, it's uber valuable, especially in New Mexico with all of these narratives coming together. Um, and just with my own personal experience in my undergrad, I took a lot of classes, obviously in the Honors College and in the Spanish department, and I, I sort of went out of my comfort zone to reach out to people of different communities. So I've worked with folklore, and I've worked with contemporary Chicanx, Chicano, Chicana um, sort of resources here, even on campus. Um, so I just really attribute that, those experiences into coming into this program, being introduced, and being immersed in this type of research. So, yeah. And then, Julia, did you mention one other thing, which is further training in this area for the researchers? Oh, right. Indeed. Right. So we actually, really exciting, we applied for a, um, for not necessarily a grant, but for admission um, to attend a workshop at UT Austin called the Voces Institute. Um, that is a about a week long workshop in Austin, where if if we are if our applications are admitted, um, we'll receive training in terms of oral history research, um, as well as ethnographic research and the, which type of methodologies work, as well. Yeah. Thank you. The largest portion of this project is, is obviously getting out into the field and interviewing these baby boomers out here in New Mexico and seeing what they have to say, as Juliana said. So we're, part of it is learning to train ourselves how to do that better. Part of it is learning to train students. And part of Juliana's role is both is doing all of that, like learning, training herself, training students, and participating in the research project itself. So our final presenter is Deborah Nieto. And she's on the paper side, is Juliana? Buenas tardes, me llamo Rieta. So, I guess everyone's talking a little bit about their background, so I will too. Uh, so, I went to UNM as well as an undergrad. I got my degree uh, in linguistics and Spanish, uh, and in my senior year, as an undergrad, I was this really disillusioned uh, student. I felt like really burnt out by school. I had no idea what I wanted to do after I graduated because I'm really bad at planning and thinking about the future. Uh, so that's where one of my Nogada comes in because she has a, a skill with recruiting people. I took a couple of really incredible um, classes about New Mexican literature and I just fell in love with them because I grew up here my whole life and I kind of had this like weird like resentment from New Mexico, and she helped me kind of dismantle all of that and turn it into like a fond, like loving feeling for New Mexico instead. So she recruited me for this program. That's why I'm here now. I'm a grad student here in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, my concentration is the Southwest, like mis colegas aquí. Um, so the research that I do is kind of going back to what Henrika mentioned at the beginning. I do a little bit more of that kind of archival type of research. Um, so what my role is, so what this project is, um, so there's this really kind of iconic 
uh, family, un nuevo mexicano family, they're called the Chacons, they're the Urbano Chacon, Eusebio Chacon, Rafael Chacon, muchos Chacones. Um, <laughs> so I focus specifically on a man named Felipe Maximiliano Chacon. Um, and this family, Felipe in particular, was really a big part of um, uh, the, like, the Mexican and like, Spanish language newspaper publications that were coming out in the 18th and 19th century. Um, right? Yeah, 19th and 20th, <laughs> 19th and 20th century newspaper publications. Um, so there's already a couple of books that exist about other Chacons, so ideally this will result in another publication that's specifically about Felipe Chacon and his life and his works. Um, so I went into this project, um, which is also funded by the Center for Regional Studies, with some vague idea of what it would be like. You know, you always kind of have some assumptions. I knew that it would do, have something to do with some archival research, something to do with New Mexican Spanish language newspapers. I was really excited to dig into those things. Um, but my last semester, the last semester working on this project wasn't quite that kind of hands-on work that I imagined, but it wasn't any less valuable. Um, last semester I worked with a lot of materials that were already provided for me. Um, so like newspaper clippings, poems, I hear of, things like that. And my role was to first transcribe those things and secondly try my very best to begin to translate those things as well. Um, and that taught me a lot too because you're not like a mindless scribe when you're doing this work, right? It's very, it's still like very involved even though it's not very like tactile. Um, you still have a lot of thoughts about everything that you're reading and everything that you're transcribing. I'm do doing this work and I'm like, why does he have so much beef with this senator from Colorado? Like, why is he writing these nasty poems and like signing with these weird cryptic like pseudonyms? Like, what's going on here? But I didn't, I wasn't able to really pry into that too, too much. Um, but you also encounter like a lot of tensions because you're learning about who this person was as a person, right? And so I discover a lot of things about him, about his legacy and his work. A lot of his legacy has to do with the fact that he's kind of framed as like a New Mexican like patriot. He's like proof that like Mexican Americans could be like patriotic, just like Anglo Americans could be. Um, and so a lot of that tension and like thoughts that I was having while I was doing this work, uh, I later then like converted into a tiny little speech. Um, I presented my work at the Lobo Bites competition last semester, and it was really crazy. I had three minutes uh, to make this research sound interesting to the mass public, and I had three minutes to talk about all the thoughts that I was having, and it was really interesting. I've never done anything like that before. Again, thank you, Anna Nguyen. She signed me up for it, and I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, so that was really cool. It was really task and learning, because another thing I learned last semester was about how to convert what might seem like very tedious work into something that can be important to a society or a community of people. So that was a lot of what I learned about um, doing that work last semester as well. Um, and I also gave a talk about that work right here, like literally I stood right here and <laughs> talked about it last semester to a group of people just like you. Um, and another really valuable thing that I learned last semester is that it really, really pays off to be a total nerd about what you do and to talk about it with other people. Because uh, I was very much so kind of on my own, like trying to transcribe, trying to translate. Like how do you translate these like very political kind of like 19th century, like Nuevo Mexicanos who are like kind of high status and you're trying to convey like a lot of those same sentiments and feelings. Um, so it was really cool because last semester I gave a little talk about my research last semester, and after the talk was done, a small little like cohort of my colleagues kind of huddled around. They're like, "But have you thought about this? And oh, have you looked into this? And oh, perhaps this like cryptic pseudonym actually means this? And also, maybe your translation would be better if it were like this." So it was really cool because I got to kind of peek into other people's brains and the thoughts and suggestions that they had about my work, things that I hadn't even thought about. Um, so that was really beneficial. So if you can take one piece of advice from this little talk that you're participating in right now, it's that it pays off to be a total nerd and just talk to people about stuff. It will always be beneficial. Um, so that was kind of my work last semester. Um, and this semester I'm now kind of transitioning back into kind of the type of work that I imagined myself doing with this project. Um, so the reality of the matter is, is that we don't know much about this Felipe Chacon guy. We know a couple of things about him. Uh, but there's definitely, you know, his biographical information is very notably lacking. Um, so my work this semester has been a lot of, like, feels like detective work. I'm trying to go in and find a little bit more about what he was like, newspapers that he published in, 
um, other things that he did, and it's been really fascinating because you find things that you don't expect to find. That's always the case with research like this. Um, so I learned that this Felipe Chacon person is way more of a chismoso than I thought he was. Um, he has beef with like everyone. He has like a little conflict with like another senator. He was actually tried by the state for libel and like spent some time in jail because he slandered a politician and he like has another, like, has other beef with, like, another newspaper editor, and they talked about that in New Mexican newspapers as well. Like, these are all things that are, like, being published and talked about, right? So that says a lot, too. He's, like, this really kind of high-profile person that people care about and that people are talking about because his name keeps popping up in all these articles. Um, and it also shows you a lot about, like, how different it is to kind of get your hands into it because uh, you know you're looking through these like super specs by the day in the center of Southwest research like looking through um, these old newspapers and it's cool because it's like you're trying to look for a specific thing right you're trying to look for like information about you're just like looking for Felipe and Mechaco wherever you can <clears throat> but it's really hard not to get distracted because there's so much interesting stuff in New Mexican newspapers it's like what's this thing that's criticizing the U.S. for like occupying Nicaragua, and what's this other thing yeah. talking about the Cuban or no, the Spanish American War? Like, there's just so many different things. It's hard to like not stray and kind of go on like a different rabbit hole <laughs> to like stay in this rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so that's a lot of what I've been doing uh, this semester. And again, it pays to talk to people. It's I've been uh, talking with librarians, with my mentor, just like trying to like get leads wherever you possibly can. There'll be like a line in a book that's like, oh, he published in this newspaper called La Aurora when he was 14 years old. That's where he started publishing poetry. And so then I went on like a crazy like search for those newspapers, like trying to find those poetry, those those poems. And I still haven't found them. But um, it's like kind of like like I said, kind of like detective work. You're like taking leads wherever you can. You're trying to find them wherever you can. You're like, oh wait, this is another thing that's kind of interesting. Let's go with that a little bit more. Um, so it's again, more of that kind of hands-on type of work that I imagined myself doing. Um, so that's what I do. It's been really cool and dynamic, and I've learned a lot. I'm very thankful for Anna for recruiting me, for the Center for Regional Studies for funding me to do it, because um, it's been really fascinating. Um, and I think that's all I have to say about my research. <laughs>
So just being bilingual and even knowing a lot of like the New Mexico archaisms and all of that is so applicable to understanding his goals. And I mean, it, it's just, I don't think anyone who's not bilingual could actually get all the value in these lines. Uh, yeah, it's played a huge role in my research too. I mean, part of uh, Felipe Machacon's like legacy is that he's like he like writes in Spanish and he does all these things in Spanish, even though he does speak English too. But he like kind of that's like a big part of like why he's important. Um, and so yeah, a lot of the materials that I work with are also like the vast majority are written in Spanish as well. Uh, and even for me, like, I kind of tried my hand a little bit at translating, which is like a whole another level. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, so yeah, it's like definitely like you have to have like a very like, nuanced understanding of the language to be able to do that. And uh, I even look back at some of my translations; and they're like, very wrong. <laughs> they're not good. <laughs> they're very not good. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's really, it's been a really important part of my research. I got a question. What makes unique the Zoom covering of Southwest identity, particularly New Mexican identities, regarding all the kind of archival work, uh, Latin American or American itself? <laughs> That's a really great question. At, at least in my collection, um, Aurelio Espinosa is not really known um, because I, I guess he had fascist views towards the end of his like career. So a lot of it just got kind of pushed under the rug and you know, his work, he did some really amazing work. In, the, in 1911, he was able pre to predict how like the evolution of Spanish in New Mexico would kind of diminish eventually. And I mean, this is work like from 1911. He was, so I think I need to bring, part of my job is to bring his work into light and show like, hey, he's like a pioneer. All of his research is pretty, you know, the fact that he was able to predict it in 1911 is pretty like important or significant right now. And with, with my project that I'm working on, I mean, we, we're, I feel like most of us are pretty familiar with the trifecta of identities in New Mexico. So we have the Anglo, Indigenous, or Native American, and then um, Mexican, Mexican American. But that those are all just umbrella terms for really what other identities there are. So mestizo, mestiza, Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx, um, and so forth. But with this work, I feel like it would contribute not only just to, to the community, so showing what these communities or what the people who reside in these communities reflect and how they perceive themselves as consumers and contributors, but also, I mean, one of the goals of this project is to make whatever findings we have accessible to the university population, to the entire, to the community who is interested to take on the sort of narratives that we find and really search through those own avenues. And I just think New Mexico has a really fascinating history, especially in relationships with the United States. Mm -hmm. People say, like, I don't know, I feel like I, I remember talking or reading somewhere at some point, like, New Mexico has been colonized twice, right? It was like a part of Mexico and it was a part of the US. Um, and so at least within like my specific research, um, Felipe, Felipe Chacón was very like present during a really turbulent, this really, really turbulent time in New Mexican history where New Mexico had just become a state. And he's kind of, I think he serves as like kind of a symbol of like the, a lot of the tensions that he's trying to articulate during the time because that must have been a crazy time in history. Like suddenly you're like Americans, but not really. Um, so I, and a lot of that was kind of what I addressed in that Lobo Bites talk that I mentioned, that like three minute, like quick, like rapid fire talk that I had to give. That's what I focused on, is that he kind of has this very complex position in his particular historical time, and he kind of, I think he can, he can kind of extrapolate and look at, that he kind of served as a tiny, tiny, teeny example of like what's going on in the bigger picture during that time in history, and I think it reveals a lot about just like American history as a whole. Um, and I'm also really fascinated, this is another thing, like another little like, rabbit hole of thought that I go down sometimes, is that he's like, 
this label is slapped onto him and they call him pr a proto Chico Nomander, like his Chico Nomander before Chico no existed. And I don't know how, I don't know how excited how I feel about that, but I do think it's really interesting because I think that also kind of says that like writers like this, because like Spanish language, you no know, Mexicano writers in like the 19th century are like pretty forgotten about. Like, people don't talk about them very much. So again, I think it's interesting that like in hindsight, people have looked back to him and been like, well, he's kind of this, he's kind of the precedent for this big, huge like, social movement that happened after him. Uh, so I think it's, that's kind of what I try to, how I try to be like, that's why studying this one person is really important, because sometimes it seems like these people just disappear into history, but they're actually very symbolic of the degree things that are happening. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, what are the theoretical implications of your work? Like in other words, if you would to do this type of research in a different region of the United States, different area, or Europe, or Africa, would you, do you think the same principles uh, would apply? And when, when you're working, because you're right now too much into the material, I understand this is the first stage, uh, but have you been able to abstract away certain principles of, you know, in your work that you could hypothetically apply to other regions later on? Um, I've come across a lot of folklore research that he's done mm -hmm. and he's trying to trace actually like certain elements within folklore, for folklore stories that aren't only just in New Mexico that could have come from Spain or have traces of like um, Moorish influence mm -hmm. and even like India influence. There's a tar baby that he talks about and I mean it's the basic, um, uh, the basic folklore is like somehow someone's eventually like it's either an animal or a human that's like tarred and then like feathers are you know it's like an embarrassment kind of folklore and it's actually really prominent like in Spain and Africa and India and here so he goes back and he's trying to actually trace like the origin based on like similar elements and and I think that's definitely like a, based on folklore you can pretty much go pretty global with it yeah I, I really like that question because when you walk into a culture you it's really hard to question is this culture is this not and that's where that um, concept of theoretical or con theoretical implications comes in um, and especially, I, I had this really great professor in the Honors College who told me that anytime you enter into a space, you should never ask what's wrong with it. It's, pretty e it's really easy to always criticize and to construct your own opinion and to go in and totally botch an interview, in my experience, right? Because I came in with that pre predisp predisposition. Um, but it's a lot harder to look at a community and just say what, not necessarily what can I do to help, but what is everything that's going right? And how can I use that as a stepping stool to really develop these sorts of thoughts and putting, putting all of these actions into culture, which I feel like is just as valuable as criticizing the culture and so on. So you would really, you have to become really adapt, adaptive depending on what kind of community, culture you're looking at. So I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yeah, I also appreciate that question. Because when you're kind of in it, just like doing this <laughs> highly specific <laughs> stuff, you're not thinking about like, what are the implications? So I appreciate it too, because now I'm going to be thinking about that. <laughs> so I'm going to do this work a little bit more. Because, yeah, I mean, this is definitely like highly specific and it's very specific to like my experience too like being someone who's grown up in New Mexico like being someone who's trying like knows more or less a little bit about the place and <laughs> has like lots of ideas and opinions about it um uh I yeah I think I yeah I agree with what Diana said it's like it's easy to kind of go in and figure out what's wrong uh without realizing that like at least in my case, like I'm studying this very particular person, it's really easy, because I've been really critical of him, and it's really easy to be critical of somebody when they existed a hundred years ago, <laughs> and like, so much has happened after them, you know. Um, so I think it's just really important to just always, 
consider people in their historical moment and always consider like just if, like so much of these things is going on and everyone's kind of just reacting to everything that's happening. Uh, so I think it's been a big, I guess, takeaway from all this work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so I have two questions. Um, the first one, it's directed to uh, Angelica. Uh -huh. um, so the guy that you're researching, uh, the folklore that he wrote down, is it more like cultural folklore of the, like his society, of like the people that he was around when he was growing up? Or is it stuff that he wrote that he created? So like more is like a, you can like take from it like, ideas about the culture or more ideas about him? It definitely more about the culture. Okay. Um, I remember reading, I came across one of his publications, I sit down, and that's where, it, where it's hard with Deborah because she's, as Deborah mentioned, she said, it's so hard not to get distracted, it's so hard to be like, oh look, you know, look at this article, but I'm over here getting distracted and I'm reading all his publications, and um, one of them talked about his journey in Spain. I guess he was funded like 28 days to go to Spain and actually do an interview with the people and um, like listen to their folklore stories and make a documentation of um, the different folklore stories they had. No one had kind of really done that before and even in his, in his um, publication he said like it's so hard to just not want to stay in one region forever because he only had like 28 days so he just wanted to stay in one region but he had to keep bouncing around and he found so many similarities to the folklore stories he heard here and it was just really cool how he was able to kind of map it out and then at the end he had this collection of all of these um, cuentos españoles and he published like three volumes just based on that one trip so it is cultural. So a lot of the stuff he did was like regional folklore then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, cool. and in addition to linguistics. Yeah. Yeah. So other question. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. this one's for Juliana. Mm -hmm. um, when, so with the research that your other colleagues are doing, it's more people that have passed away and that aren't here anymore, but yours is people that are still around. And so... Um, they can't just go up to people and like ask them like, oh, what was this like? What was this like? But you can. So like, how do you gain? How? What was your plans to like gaining access to the communities that you're talking to? Or like, I mean, have you already done that? Or yeah, I mean, gaining access really is just reaching out your your feelers and to these people who you might know who have other connections. Really, so it there's that cliche saying it. You know, it depends on who you know or something like that. But um, but with the, my other, so I'm, I'm on a team, so I'm not alone. I'm working with Professor, Professora Ana Nogari, Professor, um, or Dr. Mariah Gomez in the Honors College. So um, both have connections to Northern New Mexico, Southern New Mexico, in those regions as well. Um, but in terms of like the methodology, so really reaching out to these communities, um, that comes a lot with that interviewing methodology, which um, I'll be exploring a little bit more, but over spring break, I had a little bit of a break, but I was reading, and before then too, I was reading the works of Irving Seidman and Charles Briggs, who are really foundational researchers um, in terms of ethnographic interviews and oral history. Um, so, I mean, what one of the biggest takeaways that I've had, especially in my previous experience with interviewing, is just following a hunch. Having, asking, the, as you can say, asking the right questions, but asking questions when appropriate, um, really to get a feel for your participant, but always look forward to like a second encounter, even a third, fourth encounter with your, with your participant to get to know them as well. So I would hope that these interviews might outlast the summer. It'd be great to get to know the participants a little bit more as well, but that's just the general outlook we have. Well, I have a question since we still have a few more minutes. This is my favorite question for any researcher. So for all three of you, what's been the most surprising thing that you found during your research, uh, through the course of your research project? I know Julianne was here a little, bit, a little bit earlier still, but there's always that thing where you're like, oh my gosh, what an amazing, what is this? What is this? This is so cool. Or maybe I know exactly what this is. Or I wasn't expecting that. 
I mean, I think for me, it's been very recently. Because uh, I, I knew it, he was like, kind of like dramatic. I knew <laughs> that he like had issues with other people. I knew that he was kind of like a controversial person. Uh, and I think this semester, just realizing the extent of that controversy, it was really shocking. Like, I don't know, it was really shocking to me to like, learn that he's had so many other like pleitos with other like prominent mm -hmm. senators and other local Mexicano like editors and just finding out that he like spent time in jail and was tried by the state and like just did I don't know it's, that was really exciting I don't know it was cool because it's also, like I said like I mentioned in my like, brief little talk it's like something people are talking about like people care about it to a certain degree because it keeps showing up over and over and over again like newspapers are kind of keeping tabs um, it's like, you know, oh, he's getting tried by the state, and then another article later will be like, he didn't show up to this hearing. <laughs> like, well, okay. <laughs> um, so that's been just like really, really unexpected. I didn't expect there to be so much drama. Um, yeah. Mine's definitely kind of what I showed you a picture of. I was looking in those boxes and I came across a box of just the narrativas de la pasión. I mean, he actually spent time and watched these these plays or these like ceremonies take place in northern New Mexico and he transcribed the verses word for word and and it's just it's, it's just in a box like collecting dust it's, it's, this like little treasure is just there <laughs> so it's definitely I mean there's so much to be learned from that as far as like linguistics and folklore and you can get so much out of that and that's definitely my little like tesoro right there it's just all the verses. <laughs> yeah, for me, um, like Anna said, we're in the, the very beginning stages of this project, but I am fully prepared to sort of have my mind blown. Um, <laughs> for like lack of a better phrase, but like I, there are so many factors that attribute to the reason why people settled in New Mexico and continue to settle in New Mexico. So especially post-war settlers, so after World War II, urbanization sort of sprung up, especially in Albuquerque, and it became a metropolis. Um, people moved here for the climate, people moved here for nuclear positions, um, for the Air Force Base, and so on. Um, and also people have roots here that have spurred centuries, no? So I'm just, it'll be a little hard to keep my focus, just like my mis compañeras, right? So with the rabbit holes, people and their stories are their own rabbit holes. You know, when you ask them to tell you a story, that turns into a conversation, which turns into something really valuable and interesting and fun. So. If there are no more questions, I want to thank our three panelists. I want to Thank you. Thank you.